Okay, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the International Center for Cooperative Management Fall Webinar Series. We aim to offer about eight to 10 webinars a year to stimulate folks in conversation around themes on the cooperative economy. Mainly we're looking to uh, you know, stimulate people who are working in cooperatives, either in management or governance, um, and folks who are doing larger system building efforts as well. So I'll give you a little bit of information. This webinar is also part of the Cooperative Virtual Institutes series. So it's a whole bunch of collaborators, mainly uh, organized through the Association for Cooperative Educators and Cooperatives and Mutuals Canada, have organized a whole series of webinars hosted by different institutions that runs until next spring, uh, next June. So a lot of really good content there. I'll make sure that the link goes into the chat. For everybody to uh, check out what else is going on. We do have three more in our series that we're hosting this fall that you'll see on our website at managementstudies.coop. And I think I recognize most of the, the names and faces here on the uh, call today, but for those of you who are viewing the recording, just wanted to mention that we are a center who does uh, education, knowledge dissemination and research on the cooperative economy. And so we do have online part-time master's level business programs in cooperative management and credit union management. And we also are doing online courses, short courses, executive education. We have a two-day course coming up in December and then we're offering it again in February February on member-centric uh, management and governance for cooperatives. Okay, so let's jump right in. Keep admitting people. Okay, so we have uh, the theme of the webinar today is Cooperatives and New Economic Paradigms with Sonia Nopkovich. And most of you do know, uh, hopefully, Sonia already. She is our center director for ICCM. She's also a professor of economics at St. Mary's University, of course. Uh, she's the chair of the International Cooperative Alliance Committee on Cooperative Research. And she's on the e economist panel for the National Co-op Business Association in the US. So we're very happy to be able to have this session today. And again, I'll be watching the chat for questions coming in. We'll save those toward the end of the presentation. Uh, feel free for people to share with each other ideas, uh, things they're doing, links, all of that is welcomed. And uh, we will be doing a breakout towards the end of the session where people can kind of talk about what they're learning. We've got a few prompt questions for you. You get to meet some other folks too. And uh, you'll see the recording after. So I'll pass it over to Sonia now. Thanks so much, Sonia. Welcome. Thank you very much. You can hear me all right? Yep, excellent. All right, so I'll be talking to you about uh, co-ops and new economic paradigms. Uh, those of you who participated in the Co-op Academy a couple of weeks ago, this is the same presentation. Uh, so you don't need to worry about listening to it again. Uh, but uh, if you stick with it, <laughs> there'll be candy at the end. <laughs> I see some faces who are there. Um, anyway, so what I'll, uh, well, the motivation really for this is that we've been talking in, in our, both our program, but also the uh, Imagine 2012 conference uh, some years ago, in 2012, obviously, eight years ago now, about the issues with the economy and where cooperatives have a role to play. But we haven't really ever explored what is new and what, what other, what kinds of economies can we envision and you know, how can the economy change and where are cooperatives playing a role in those new paradigms? And the new paradigms really go back to uh, the thinking uh, you know, just before neoclassical economics uh, dominated the world. Um, so it, it's really not all new, but it's renewed interest in, in some of these um, concepts and, and thinking about what the purpose of the economy really is. So we need a new dominant economic paradigm. I think the consensus is building, if it hasn't been built already, uh, that the paradigm of neoclassical economics and neoliberal policies uh, hasn't really worked well for the planet, much as it seemed that it would back in the 80s. Um, so the new paradigm is needed because we have new realities. Living in a pandemic now, it's almost a no-brainer. Uh, but the crisis and the sense of urgency and, you know, from climate change through financialization of the economy and financial bubbles that are popping uh, up and, the, and bursting on a regular basis, uh, income inequality and poverty, all sorts of social issues 
um, you know, disenfranchised, uh, marginalized populations, health and housing crises and uh, exclusion and so on. So this rapid pace, uh, the, the, these uh, variables or these crises in the sense of urgency are accompanied by a rapid pace of change and new technology uh, that gives both, the, that speeds up the issues, but it also gives new opportunities. So the cartoon tells you there that uh, trickle-down economics uh, really hasn't worked and, uh, you know, the tide that's uh, right, lifting all boats hasn't really kicked in. So what are those new, uh, new directions, right? Uh, one big uh, that seems to be gaining momentum is the uh, Sustainable Development Agenda, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the UN uh, in, uh, initiative that followed from Millennium Development Goals. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals were delivered in 2015, and uh, this has been the um, follow-up only much, much broader and much more uh, uh, ambitious. So it's supposed to mobilize all economic actors. It's, it calls to action. It calls for transformative change. So SDGs are supposed to transform the economy. And we're looking at partnerships for change because no single group, either of enterprises or governments, can do this alone. So we need the civil society. We need all sorts of uh, economic uh, agents and we need the governments uh, behind this effort to actually see change. Um, unfortunately, the political will isn't quite where we would hope it would be, uh, but you know, let's wait and see uh, whether that tide will shift. Uh, the new economic paradigms that I will be talking about today is uh, this uh, address of sustainability, the uh, planetary boundaries within uh, some you know, socially sustainable systems, the circular economy, social and solidarity economy, and the economy for the common good. So those are the ones that uh, uh, I think have uh, some implications for, uh, for cooperative economics thought. So where do co-ops fit in? Can they serve as agents of socioeconomic transformation that's called for by the sustainable development agenda? And uh, I, I see co-ops as leaders in some of these spaces, but, uh, you know, potential leaders, because I'm not sure that we are leading yet uh, in some of these spaces. And uh, starting us off is uh, this uh, clear uh, change or signal of change in the business uh, world that's reflected in a shift from sole focus on shareholders into stakeholder purpose for businesses that's been voiced both by the Business Roundtable in the United States in 2019 and the World Economic Forum in Davos in the Davos Manifesto that makes the same statement. So it is about uh, all stakeholders that need to be engaged in this shared value creation. Um, if you read the new book, uh, I'm going to advertise it a little bit, The New Corporation. I just started reading it, actually. I don't know if you can see it right there. The New Corporation by Joel Bacon, uh, Bacon who, has, uh, who is behind The Corporation, the film and the first, uh, the first uh, book. Um, it's interesting to, to see his take on the Davos Manifesto, because he was there. Uh, and basically tells the story of Davos making this statement that it's time to change and shift the purpose of the business, and yet, congratulatory tone to Donald Trump on the stage by the same group of people saying, well, you know, thank you for cutting the taxes, uh, cutting corporate taxes, that's a great job. So it, there is really this duality of, uh, you know, what is really the, the, the purpose of business and can they deliver this sort of mission? So uh, there is room for cooperatives to step into that space is what I'm trying to the message I'm trying to convey here. All right, so sustainability, we're all, I think, more or less familiar with what it is and what it means. Um, so this increasing awareness of planetary boundaries uh, has been present since 1970s in some reports and scientific uh, evidence that we cannot sustain the planet the way we were going. Um, and circular economy thinking was then uh, in, in you know, uh, first stages. Um, and some of that thinking is now back on the agenda. So, you know, this cradle to cradle design that you can design a product to be circular and to reuse materials and not produce waste uh, comes from, from this thinking back in the 70s and 80s. The Brundtland Commission uh, kind of changed the course on sustainability 
uh, with the report in 87, and there was a consensus that, uh, you know, a sustainable future has to be on the agenda uh, of, uh, of um, decision makers. And sustainability means that we leave the planet for the future generations so that they can actually live on it. Um, but this transformation is what interests me as well. You know, it is, so, so the uh, transformation and this tr the, the transformative purpose of sustainable development goals today requires attacking the root causes. This is the unraised definition. Uh, it's attacking the root causes that generate and reproduce economic, social, political, and environmental problems and inequities, and not merely their symptoms. So we've been addressing the symptoms with many of the changes, and we have not been going after the root causes because that is really the elephant in the room uh, in, in many instances. So my question, are COPs fit for the task? Can, can they be agents of transformation and under what conditions? Are they adaptive? Do they create resilient and sustainable communities? And I am not suggesting that all COPs are made equal, but um, some will rec recognize themselves in this effort to actually be transformative, whereas others may not. So we, this is why we actually have education uh, in COP business, right? To actually try and be the, the, the agent of transformation. So this is the first concept that's really uh, resonating with people. This is the donut of Kate Rayworth. Kate Rayworth published this for uh, Oxfam in um, 19, uh, 2010, I believe it was, 2010. What she did is she pulled together the thinking on sustainability and scientific boundaries of the planet and put it into this nice graphic presentation so that we really it's uh, taken off her concept of the donut has taken off because it is such a nice uh, graphical representation of what we're talking about so in the donut what Kate Rayworth is looking at is that there is the inner circle of social foundations that, that there is you know uh, the critical the minimum of social foundations that we need to have in society to thrive and then there's the outer bound uh, the ecological ceiling, so this is the dark circle on the outer side, uh, with, uh, you know, if we, if we overstep those boundaries, we are in the planetary degradation space. So we need to operate within those two bounds. So one is the uh, ecological ceiling and the other is the minimum social foundations that we require as, uh, as humans. And so the safe and just space for humanity is in that light green area, in the donut, right? Or uh, on the donut but how she doesn't prescribe. So what form of, of, you know, what kind of microeconomics are we talking about? What kinds of economic relationships are we talking about? What, who owns what, who does what is not in this picture, right? And this is where our imagination can, can take off. Um, so in the uh, social foundations, she is talking about, again, the minimum would be on the line. If you're inside with any of these, which is uh, access to food, to healthcare, education, energy, uh, networks, housing, uh, peace, justice, political voice, and so on. Those are all really uh, social foundations that are captured by the human development work and so sustainable development goals. So that's what, what's inside this bubble, right? Uh, and if you have a shortfall, this is the problem. So we want to create uh, economic uh, activity uh, and social activity, quite frankly, to actually make sure that everybody on the planet is meeting the minimum of this of, of these uh, of these uh, variables. And then on the outside, <coughs> excuse me, uh, she's looking at climate change, at biodiversity loss, air pollution, ozone layer depletion. So the outside are variables that uh, uh, have been published by by the scientific community. Two papers, 2009 and 2015, uh, and uh, references are in Kate Rayworth's reference that I have there on the screen. Uh, so so this, these are the recognized um, boundaries, planetary boundaries, that have been impacted by human activity in the Anthropocene. And when she uh, looks at this inside and the social foundations, she is looking at indicators, and I'll put the list up there, indicators uh, that actually capture this uh, the deprivation, right? So for example, on food, there is one indicator, and this is why you have one red bar. And on health, there are two indicators, so you have two bars, 
right? So the indicator for food on that, in that table tells you it's population that's undernourished and it's 11%, according to the data that she's using between 2014 and 16. So undernourished population of 11% goes into that red deprivation bar on food. On healthcare, you have two indicators. One is uh, under five mortality rate and the other one is life expectancy. And you see the you know, 46% and 39% respectively, that's deprivation uh, variables, right? And so she has one or two indicators for each of these items. And again, they're given in the table there. But what's also interesting is that each of these is actually connected to a sustainable development goal. So goal number two on zero hunger and food indicator are a match. And I keep going here. Uh, the sustainable go development goal three and four. Uh, so I'll just list them up without reading through them. But what I'm trying to show you is that, that this Kate Rayworth's framework of a donut is directly connected in the social foundations, directly connected to SDGs. And again, there is a correspondence between uh, SDGs and, and the indicators that she's using. Um, on the outside, there is the uh, red zone where we have overstepped the boundaries already. The grays are the ones where we don't have a well-defined threshold. We don't know what is the limit. And the white ones are the ones where we haven't, or actually you see the little, the inside the green is that we are within, within uh, accepted, acceptable bounds, right? But where we have already overshot the planetary boundaries is on biodiversity, on climate change, uh, land conservation, uh, land conversion, sorry, and nitrogen, uh, nitrogen emissions. So, when she puts the two together, we get this picture that you may be familiar with. Uh, and it's, as I said, a fantastic presentation of what needs to be done and where we are overshooting, where we are not delivering enough and where we are uh, overshooting the planetary bounds. So what Kate Rayworth, uh, she has a little book on, on this and it's really a, an easy read. I would strongly recommend it. Uh, but what she does conclude is that there are certain principles that we need in order you know, for the economy to function in the proper green zone, uh, and that our economy has to be regenerative. It's not enough to not just pollute any longer uh, or you know, to lose more, more, more biodiversity. It's now about returning, uh, you know, getting some back if we can. Uh, and so we need to have a regenerative economy. It's not enough to not pull, just to not do any harm. It's now time to actually try and regrow what we can, if we can. Um, and it has to be a distributive economy by design in order to uh, satisfy uh, social uh, minimum requirements, right? So uh, this is, again, the, the prescription from Kate Rayworth that we need a distributive economy and a regenerative economy. On the distributive side, I think cooperatives do really well. Um, so this is about who owns the resources and how are they shared? Are they, are, does everybody have access to them? So from health and education to land and housing to energy ideas, uh, you know, open source, uh, enterprise ownership, this is pretty well on social aspects that I think cooperatives and like-minded uh, entities do well. On regenerative, we have to be determined uh, or deliberate about becoming uh, regenerative, right, where possible. Um, and uh, so this is working with and within the cycles uh, of the planet and the living world running on sunlight, getting into, into uh, renewable energy, uh, waste becoming food, again, cyclical, uh, circular, modular by design and open source. So this is the Rayworth concept. There are other, others who talk about uh, regeneration, and I'm just uh, using this uh, Regenesis group, Bill Reed's conceptualization of the same issue, which is that right now, traditional conventional technical system design is degenerative, but just being green is still not getting us where we need to go. Being sustainable is the status quo. It's where we are right now, which is still not good enough. We need to be restorative and regenerative and model our existence by uh, living, system, living systems and um, living system design. Uh, a lot of this is on the circular economy. This is the next concept. The circular economy, uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation's website, 
has a lot of resources on the circular economy and it speaks to some of these uh, regenerative designs and natural systems that can be used in how we design buildings, how we use urban planning, how we do architecture, how we do uh, even, even paint. Uh, it's really fascinating to take a look at those. Um, so the circular economy is about designing the products that we use uh, to not pollute, to not create waste, um, and uh, you know, at, at the manufacturing stage or the design stage before you manufacture, if you have the, a design system to be recirculated, re re right, um, then you are not going. To, you will avoid pro producing waste. Sorry. Um, so it's uh, about you know the user reuse, repair, and recycling sector, of course. But you see on that other graphic that the linear economy that we have now is uh, take, make, use, and then dump into waste. Uh, recycling is still some waste, and we know that numbers are under 10% of what gets recycled, even where it works well. Um, so that's not a solution. The solution is to not produce any waste or to minimize waste production at, you know, at, at all costs. So this is where uh, circular economy is, um, uh, again, producing a lot of resources to actually try and, and go circular. Uh, there's some uh, criti criticism of circular economy. And I want to point that out because there is, you know, potentially an issue with it, uh, which is that it's not, uh, circularity is understood to not have to change consumption patterns. So we can just consume as we're consuming, we can just live this and have the standards that we're having, we can continue to look for growth and keep growing. Um, but really, you know, the, the, this rebound effect that with, with circularity, we actually may end up lowering the prices and therefore even more gets produced and more gets used, that consumption has to also change and it's not enough to just be circular. Um, so good practices within the circularity would be to share or lease rather than to own. So any sharing economy uh, is not a bad idea. Reusing, reducing and recycling as the last resort. Um, so the next concept of the next stages or the new ideas. And this one is, is pretty new and, and interesting uh, in my mind from the cooperative perspective, that the economy for the common good. This is um, Christian Felber in Vienna. Uh, he's working at the university, uh, Vienna University, and um, basically came up with this um, rethinking of what is the purpose of economic activity. Again, he's not the only one who, who's been looking for answers there. But what he did come up with is that the economy is not about increasing wealth. It's about uh, common good, well-being for everyone. Um, so it is you know, good life for everyone on a healthy planet. And that, that should be the primary goal and purpose of economic activity. And Felber, in his videos, there's plenty of TED Talks from him in, online uh, and in his book, uh, talks about actually uh, many national um, constitutions that talk about economic activity and its purpose being the common good. So it's really interesting that actually the political decision and the thinking about economic activity uh, has been in line with well-being for all and not with wealth creation and increasing uh, you know, monetary gain. And where we landed uh, in the last few decades. <clears throat> so the values driven business uh, is what he's uh, suggesting at the micro level and that the businesses are committed to human dignity, uh, promoting human dignity, um, solidarity and social justice, environmental sustainability and transparency and co-determination. Co-determination is uh, a term used to say that workers have decision making powers. So workers are participants in governance. Um, so the uh, <clears throat> interesting aspect of this is that uh, he's also linking it to policy and suggesting that national governments should use fiscal and monetary policy incentives, um, such as tax breaks, to values-based and values-driven businesses. So if a business can show that they're in fact satisfying uh, uh, you know, the, the, the focus on the common good, then they should actually have an advantage in, uh, in, in uh, the system. Uh, not, so it's de-incentivizing profit seeking and de-incentivizing de opportunism. Um, 
to do that, he has created this common good matrix, he and his team, um, and behind each of these, so um, you know, so there's the stakeholders that we're concerned about, that both their suppliers, their owners, they are employee employees, they are customers and social environment, uh, and values that they subscribe to are human dignity, solidarity, environmental sustainability, and transparency and co determination. Behind this, again, if you go online, there is uh, uh, there are resources. There's a whole uh, guide. There are guidelines and uh, a you know workbook that gives you the indicators. Uh, and it gives you the indicators in steps. So if you want to, to reach human dignity in the supply chain, you may start at the basic level and then it gives you up to excellence in, in reaching this goal. So indicators that you can actually track uh, and, uh, and report on that actually hits every one of these uh, cells in the matrix. So it's really an interesting tool and there are many indicators that are well fit for both sustainability and cooperative uh, ownership and, um, and cooperative model. So this one I like quite, quite a bit. The next one where cooperatives fit in and uh, participate in is the solidarity economy, a social and solidarity economy these days. We call it SSE. Uh, there was a, a differentiation between the social economy and the solidarity economy. Nowadays, they are converging more and more into SSC, social and solidarity economy. Uh, cooperatives have always been considered to belong to the social economy, together with associations and mutuals. Um, they were not always considered to be in the solidarity economy, <laughs> which is about changing the system. But as I said, now we have a converging understanding uh, that SSC has to be about wanting to change the system and, uh, uh, and uh, the structure of the economy. So this is the framework that, um, I want to say Nathan Miller, is that the right name? Miller is the last name, Nathan, I think it is, 2010. He has this circle and this one has been reworked, um, but it's basically showing that the social solidarity economy um, is a different way to engage through reciprocity and mutuality in all aspects of economic activity. And so some of the entities that belong to, uh, to the solidarity economy uh, in production, for example, are worker co-ops and collectives, employee stock ownership is there, not-for-profit collectives are there, self-employment, producer co-ops, and so on. But you go through exchange and transfer, through fair trade, but also barter and gifting, right, and solidarity markets. Um, so, you know, a solidarity market, for example, um, Barcelona City has a solidarity market where they actually uh, induce solidarity training and, and exchange. Um, and on, to, on consumption, to ethical purchasing, to housing co-ops, uh, car and ride share, and so on. So a whole host of entities that belong to social solidarity economy uh, where cooperatives can find themselves pretty much in every aspect of, of its circle, right? So this is the concept, again, it's been around for a while. But uh, what's relatively new is this convergence of understanding that we, in fact, are about uh, transforming the system. And um, yeah, so this is about transformation, about ownership control, and a different purpose of economic activity. But the purpose of economic activity is not uh, to, again, increase wealth and sell your enterprise as fast as you can to make more money from it but to actually sustain um, a, a system of economic exchange and production in a community and keep it alive for as long as, as the community needs it. Um, the altogether um, new thinking, as I said, new, renewed thinking uh, then boils down to these choices uh, for today. So the donut economics of Kate Rayworth, the circular economy, the social solidarity economy, SDGs that are underpinning Kate Rayworth's work, and the economy for the common good. Um, as I said, the uh, incentive structure is different in the economy for the common good framework and social solidarity economy framework. That's where incentives are different. But back to my question of transformation, right? So SDGs do have the goal to transform the economy. That's what's written in the UN uh, 
publications. And then Alan White in a conference, uh, the founder of uh, Global Reporting Initiative, uh, Frameworks for Reporting on, on Sustainability, uh, stated that what GRI has accomplished is a fascinating set of indicators and measures, but um, it, it didn't change the lack of sustainability in the economy. So we, he stated, we, needed, we need to repurpose the enterprise. The purpose of the enterprise has to change. And uh, I showed you this book that I just started reading, just came out, um, where uh, Joe Bacon says that the way, so he's tracking these uh, enterprises that are, that are you know, moving into sustainability and uh, green production and so on, and states that the way corporations have changed, though real and significant, because there is a real and significant change that's, that's noticeable, they're not fundamental. In, uh, in that, the fundamental goal of a corporation is still to respond to, to uh, shareholders. So while they might, they might care about social and environmental values, they care only to the point such caring may cut into profits. Then they stop caring. So the, the foundational purpose of a corporation, and he's talking about corporation, corporations that are publicly traded in, in stock exchanges, the, you know, the whole point is the return on investment. So it's really a balancing act. And you will be socially minded and green as long as that cuts costs. And it does cut costs in many instances, right? But when it doesn't, then it's not going to be your focus. So to me, the cooperative fundamental purpose is exactly not that, right? So what is the cooperative fundamental purpose? And it seems to be to mitigate social and economic injustice by means of collective action. So if the socioeconomic injustice creates unsustainable systems, right? So whether uh, it's a group of farmers who are being, uh, you know, uh, well, mistreated or, or the price, is, well, price that they receive is too low because there is a market power, you know, single buyer in the market, that would be economic injustice. Um, you know, through social injustice of all sorts, uh, you know, exclusion of all kinds, including work. Um, and so then you look at SDGs, right? And, and this question of transformation and where do cooperatives fit with the sustainable development goals. Some SDGs, so all so SDGs all together, put together, are absolutely non-disputable, I think. Everything they want to hit is absolutely needed to be hit uh, in order for us to transform the system. However, when you look at each of the indicators behind SDGs, many are offering incremental changes and some are actually perpetuating the problem. So we need to be mindful of what indicators we resort to. In fairness, indicators behind SDGs are macroeconomic indicators, but there are efforts to turn them into a company level uh, there is the global compass that's being uh, created to actually, you know, offer uh, indicators at the company level. And even there, uh, you have to be really mindful of which ones actually are, are, you know, perpetuating the status quo and which ones are going to move us in a different direction. And so this is where I think cooperatives and like-minded enterprises have something to offer. Um, so what is the cooperative difference then in, in, in this framework? Uh, if the purpose is to mitigate social and economic injustice by means of collective action, uh, cooperatives internalize the externalities. What that means is that you don't minimize the cost, you don't pay your labor poorly, you don't damage the planet, you don't do unethical, uh, you know, run unethical businesses to make the most profit possible to then give it back, you know, to plant trees or whatever the case may be. That's not how it goes. This is the charitable model. You have to make as much, and, and the philanthropic model. You have to make as much profit and then you can give back to community. Well, by then it's too late. You've already dam done damage, uh, you know, along the way. So internalizing the externalities means that you are going to increase your costs, uh, you know, and you may have a lower profit margin, but you're not damaging people and the planet while, while you're doing business. And, and this is really an important element of what cooperatives are supposed to be about, and, and many are about. Um, but it's also addressing those structural issues that need transforming, right? Which is an unequal income distribution. That's an outcome of, uh, of uh, our property rights. The dominant role of capital. Again, uh, there, there are books written um, 
Thomas Piketty being one, right, that's probably the, the most famous uh, of them all, that looks at how much wealth has been created due to capital ownership. And our solutions cannot just be to have a broader distribution of that capital earnings, right, but to actually try and mitigate, you know, what, what is fair and what is right for capital returns. Um, global production consumption and services are, are absolutely uh, out of whack. Uh, long supply chains and commodification of necessities, so land, labor, money, healthcare, have all become commodities, whereas they should be publicly accessible public goods, common goods, right? So, uh, you know, selling land, selling labor, uh, making money for money, and uh, these are the three elements of, um, uh, of uh, Oh boy, now the name escapes me. I'll come back to you with the economist who actually talked about land, labor, and money as fictitious commodities, Polanyi, thank you. So Carl Polanyi, but there's more to it. There's also the enterprise these days that's become commodified. As I said, you know, we teach in business schools that you should start a business and sell it as fast as you can for as much money as you can. Uh, and so the business itself has become the commodity. Who works in it, what happens to people is totally irrelevant. Um, so then what is the cooperative difference? Uh, and, uh, you know, in, this, in the creation of indicators, in creation of, of what it is we should pay attention to. So sustainability from the cooperative perspective to me is about distribution of power and income. It is about subordinate role for capital, understanding that capital is necessary, but that cannot be the focus of the economic activity. You have to be a viable business, of course, uh, but... Um, the uh, role of capital must be secondary. The competitive pressure, the yardstick role, this is fixing prices. As I said, if you have a single buyer of agricultural products, then creating a co-op is going to push the prices up for all farmers, not just cooperative members. Promoting human dignity that impacts workers, consumers, producers, and community. So human dignity is not just about your own members, whoever they are, but about all people involved in and impacted by your, directly impacted by your business. Decommodification. Um, so to me, again, sustainability from the call perspective is for land, labor, money, housing, food, necessities to not be commodified. And I'll give you the example of housing co-ops. That's exactly what they do. They remove housing from market pressures and market spe especially speculative markets, right? Uh, so they remove... Uh, and, and thereby uh, provide access to housing uh, to people who otherwise couldn't, couldn't afford it really. Uh, so it's really removing housing and, uh, as I said, health and others from market uh, fluctuations and market pressures and, and pricing that people can't afford and should have access to all of these basic services. Longevity, serving future generations. Enterprise is not a commodity. It's not exposed to capital market speculations. And that is an advantage in my mind. And growth by networks spawning and spin-offs rather than growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Although, if you look at the cooperative world, we can see some issues there that many have grown and grown and grown, right? And, so, and then the question is, okay, are you actually able to handle democracy, democratic governance with such, such uh, widespread growth? But that's, uh, again, a whole other topic. So where you grow by networks, so small, local, embedded, and growing into global networks, spawning and spin-offs, you know, spinning off smaller uh, enterprises. This is what Mondragon has done well uh, through, through the years uh, in spinning off smaller entities and then uh, having a cooperative, co-op to co-op trade, principle six. All right, so this is uh, where I stop and invite you I think Erin will pop up somewhere to put you all into some kind of groups, if we have enough people for groups, do we? Yeah, do you want to start with any questions, Sonia? Yeah, we'll start with questions, but just to say what I'm hoping that people can discuss in the breakout. Sure. What resonates? What rings true? What in all of this you agree or disagree with, right? What kinds of future models do you see yourself? What do you think your co-op is doing? Is it proactive in circular economy? In you know, in uh, a regenerative economy, in any of these, uh, you know, social solidarity economies? Um, or is it reactive to the changing economic paradigms? Is it still struggling to actually see its role in these spaces? Is it contributing to system change and how? 
So I think this would be really interesting to hear from you about. And yeah, and what you like or didn't like uh, in, in the ones I've chosen to talk about. So let's go to questions first. Thanks, Erin. Okay, so none of them have actually come up in the chat yet, but because we've done this on Zoom as a sort of shared space, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask any questions to Sonia, you're free to do that now. I've got one question for Sonia, if that's okay. Um, Sonia, this I know if this is the second time that I've seen this, but I uh, actually found it you know, immersed the second time uh, better, I think, than the first time. For some reason, I'm not sure why. Uh, maybe that didn't have the pressure of some work behind it to uh, to influence me. But uh, a question is, I was at the AGM for Mid Counties Co-op this week, uh, sorry, the half yearly meeting online, and I asked a question of the chief exec, which was um, that I'm sure he would agree that the cooperative economy is more important now than ever. And the question was, what are they doing um, to help grow the cooperative economy? Um, and the answer that I got was, um, yeah, we're, we, you know, we will, we will work with other co-ops where it's viable and feasible. Um, it was a little bit of a politician's answer. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on how implementing something like this that could be measured would actually um, allow him or allow others to be able to point to something to say, yes, we can see clearly you are helping to grow the COVID economy or, you know, you get a B minus, you still have some work to do. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting COP that you chose. And, uh, you know, for me, because I know a little bit about them, uh, which if you picked any other, maybe I wouldn't. But uh, mid counties, I know, has actually used the balanced scorecard back from 2002. Um, they've developed their own balanced scorecard to actually execute their strategy. So they've worked with indicators, they have worked with uh, numbers, they have been driven by numbers for a long time. And this just goes to show you that the numbers and indicators you choose, it's one thing to, to select them to uh, ex you know, execute your strategic plan and to keep checking them monthly to see how you're doing, if you have benchmarks and you're you know, trailing and tracking that, versus those big picture goals that maybe need to be checked on once a year and are not being tracked and are not being micro, you know, managed, um, where it's, we need to grow the, the comp economy. How are we going to do that, right? But so you have to be deliberate about it. So Mid Counties is one fantastic cooperative that has been very much present in the movement and that in fact has adhered to this measurement. But I don't know that they have measures that actually track uh, principle six and what business they do with co-ops and who is in their supply chain that's in the cooperative world. And again, is their job to build the cooperative economy? I don't know that they had this, those conversations. Um, and if they have, then they sh they, there should be indicators that they're tracking and the place where they should report. The, the challenge is really with every business to survive. And as today, especially, I can, I can absolutely understand that survival is the mode, <laughs> the modus operandi today, right? At this moment um, but so, so this understanding of why it matters what does it matter to us right is is so difficult to nail until you see systems like Emilia Romagna where it's normal to hire somebody into a management position who actually knows the co-ops inside and out and when you have that kind of talent <laughs> and the talent pool around you it doesn't matter that they work for an agricultural co-op yesterday and for a consumer co-op tomorrow you have them understanding the big picture it's very different than when you have to hire somebody from you know, the straight business or mainstream business background. You need to train them and retrain them. By the time you do that, you're demutualizing. And so it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really critically important to understand that just on that level, it's important to actually build the cooperative community so that you have more people. Board of directors, I mean, again, you know, if you have more people around you who actually can come to the board and be ready for a co-op, <laughs> you know, governance, fantastic. I mean, so much less work for you to do. So I think this, this, you know, narrow thinking about our benefit today and maybe next year is really something that I understand why it happens, but it's really difficult to, to uh, push them back to say, you know what, we need to be the builder, build the bigger picture because all of us will benefit down the road from actually doing it. 
So yeah, so it'd be good to talk to mid-counties about the indicators they use for that. I don't know that they have any. Yeah. I'll make sure to ask on the next call. Yeah, I they have just... it in their annual report, the wheel. They turn yeah, the, the right. balance scorecard into the wheel. And if you look at the wheel, it's really the, as I said, strategic planning tool. But outside of that, I don't know what they have for the bigger picture. Yeah. I would say Thanks. just very briefly to add to that, that perhaps some societies, um, it would, I know you talk about business as normal, but maybe it would help them survive by actually growing the cooperative economy. I mean, I if think you think so. of the, the fall of the cooperative bank in the UK, yeah. um, it was an IT disaster. The amount of money that was spent on that, that money being spent in the economy, they might still be here. So I think that's worth the debate, but for another day. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And what and what we are missing is cooperative funds, you know, the, the, the kinds of funds that Italians have, where you do put those three percent into the fund to grow the cooperative economy. If that's what the global, you know, cooperative movement would be doing, we'd be way ahead. Yeah. It's got a comment in the chat from John McNamara, graduate of the master's program and PhD in economics as well, uh, who said that he once in, suggested- in, in management, yeah. In management, yeah. Uh, one suggested in a paper that we should create a rating system like wines for co-ops. So Sunkist might have a base level of 50, but Rainbow Grocery or Unicorn might have a 90. There you go. That, that relates to a question that I have um, about uh, B Corp certification, because that essentially is what B Corp um, certification does and gives companies who are trying to do business for good as a rating. And I'm just curious, um, Sonia, how you see that fitting or not fitting into, into all of this? Uh, cooperative certification exists. Latin Americans have um, devised cooperative certification system and they do it on the principles, the seven principles. They have, I think, four indicators which you eat with each of the principles. Um, that are contextualized a little bit more than, than uh, anyway, there, there are some questions in there that may not be necessarily immediately logical to somebody uh, in the Netherlands. But uh, nevertheless, they have a certification system and they have, this is social accounting. Many co-ops in uh, the uh, Latin countries have social balance reporting, right? This is social accounting. Um, and then uh, the Latin American system was, uh, or still is, that you actually have um, an assessment, whether you adhere to the principles and then you have a certification. And certification is good for two or three years and then you have to reapply and be recertified. recertified. Um, the International Co-op Alliance is now under, talking about an effort, I don't know how far they've gone with it, to have an ISO, the international standards uh, for co-ops, right? So again, adherence to the principles and you would have an ISO, whatever number, as a certified co-op, right? So these conversations have been around. Um, there is a P6 co-op in the United States that also, I don't know how well it's doing these days, probably not so great, but the idea was that you have a sticker on your products like fair trade. you have a P6 that says this is a cooperative uh, supply chain, right? So principle six, co-op to co-op trade, and you have a sticker on your product that says it's principle six. So, so many of these efforts have been attempted um, and, and we just have to keep at it because agreeing on what principles, uh, you know, what, uh, what indicators we would use is really not so straightforward because of the diversity of the system. And so many cops actually go into B Corp uh, you know, certification. So they're cooperative, they're also B Corp certified and that makes sense if you want to right away be recognized as benefit and not uh, corporate goal, right? So, so it's, you know, it, a quick answer, efforts have been ongoing, and, but they're sporadic. And one unified effort that I'm seeing now is the I, uh, ISO, is ISO uh, certification. And uh, if that doesn't come through, then we just have to continue to, to try and, and have that sticker that's clear. Yeah. Diversity yeah, is the cool. problem. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. I've been struggling with that a little bit because our, our cooperative, I work for a credit union and we've gone through the B Corp certification process, which 
you know, is quite lengthy and, and time consuming. And mm. this program has me thinking, gosh, did we put our efforts into the right place? Should we be putting those efforts and that kind of money into talking about cooperative principles and values instead? But mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we'll move forward with the B Corp certification just because it helps people take that step from if people aren't aware of the cooperative economy and, and the benefits of cooperatives uh, going from complete unawareness to cooperatives is hard, right? So yeah. to me, B Corp is almost like a stepping stone to get people thinking, okay, business as a force for good, cooperative economy. It, I don't know. It, to me, that makes sense. Yeah. And it's values sharing, you know, so B Corps are, are good because it's, it's values based, but, uh, but cooperative recognition, I think would be really important. Um, and so, uh, you know, the next Congress of the International Co-op Alliance, which is now moved, it's in Seoul, Korea in 21, December 21, is going to be all about cooperative identity and this branding and, and uh, uh, you know, so these issues are really critically important. So think about contributing, think about engaging in that conversation and pushing the agenda through the accounting bodies for co-ops, through, you know, talk to us and we'll link you up with people who are working on this. So. Uh, it's really important to have that push. Thank you. Thank you. We've got Elizabeth and then Bakary. And I think because of the um, because of the size of the group and the time left, if anybody wants to comment to the larger group about any of these questions too, they could do that thereafter. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you, Erin. Happy International Credit Union Day to everyone. Oh, Hi, so thank you. you. <laughs> Good morning here from the Philippines. So uh, my question is basically uh, about uh, what you have shared uh, earlier. Uh, actually, this is timely because we are currently having our uh, virtual strategic planning. And my first question is if I can share some of your slides during our session because we have still four sessions for our virtual planning. And um, we are also using the balance scorecard in terms of our uh, diversifying our corporate uh, objectives. My, our, uh, my question is, because we have this kind of discussion about our vision, because we believe that we have to be uh, smart when it comes to vision before we can uh, classify it into corporate objectives and then balance scorecard. Our current vision is to be globally competitive cooperative insurance system, but we think that this is not smart because this is broad. Although our prior to the pandemic, we are planning that uh, to expand our business uh, international, but due to this pandemic, we have realized that uh, this will take uh, time, take time to happen. So we are ch uh, checking if uh, we can just uh, protect, for example, a percentage of the people in the cooperative. Uh, what can you su uh, suggest uh, for a win-win solution on how we can um, maintain our status in the industry and uh, to create a social uh, economy as what you have discussed earlier. That's a big question uh, and I'm not even Sorry sure that, that. Uh, catching everything but again you know yes slides absolutely anything that's useful please do share it's it's okay uh, we'll we'll share the slides with you uh, what, you know, what's, again, it depends on you, your members, or your community that you're serving. Uh, to me, the, 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 you know, for credit unions and cooperatives, think about other cooperatives and credit unions you can, that you can link up with. That, that to me is the strategy, right? The number one, if that doesn't work, then go to plan B. But, you know, first is, okay, who are we serving? Are we actually a financial institution or are we a community developer? If you're a community developer, which to my mind is what uh, cooperative banks and financial organizations should be, uh, then who, you know, who, who do you have in your immediate, um, what, what needs are, are need to be met in your immediate uh, vicinity? And then link up with like-minded ent you know, entities and, and keep the network growing. So I, you know, so, so again, we can talk separately because I'm not sure that I'm, I'm hitting on what your question really is asking. But, uh, but to me, cooperation among cooperatives, cooperating with like-minded businesses, supporting social solidarity economy through your work and products and the way you do business uh, is, is really key. For some ideas, I would go to the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. 
GABV, Global Alliance for Banking on Values, they have uh, definitions, indicators, uh, financing the real economy idea, all of those things are really kind of interesting. And Van City Credit Union, that some of our students belong to, uh, has also a lot of, uh, on their uh, website in terms of uh, annual reporting and the ideas of what their purpose is. So they're redefining wealth, they're going into, communi into communities and, and making sure that they meet the needs of their members that are not necessarily uh, savings accounts and mortgage, uh, you know, mortgage products. So it's really like, for, for example, now that uh, the labor force has changed so much and many people are self-employed, Van City uh, stepped up and is offering insurance uh, and benefits to self-employed members that they have. Uh, so, you know, so, so this is to consumers. So it's very, very different mindset in terms of once you live in your community, understanding what products you can innovate in to actually meet those needs. So that's where I think, uh, yeah, and understanding uh, the role of, of financial co-ops as, as community developers. Um, I'll share with you also, remind me, uh, the Ethical Bank. We have videos. Maybe, Erin, you can send that with, with Goranieras, those interviews, because I think it gives you an idea of how you can actually use technology to crowdfund or your members can fund each other and each other's projects and evaluate them based on these indicators of, of uh, uh, common good so the common good matrix use so we'll send you materials and you can kind of try and put them it out. in the chat pull them from the chat slides are already there good okay back very briefly and then we have uh, Hanan and then other questions coming up in the chat go ahead thank you very much Erin I just have a short question which I want to ask that is, um, we are talking about the new economy, which is the cooperative economy, which I actually agree with you, Sonia, that uh, we need it. But um, uh, looking at history, we know capitalism just don't, don't, did not come to, to exist and uh, dominate the economy as it is because it started on something. And I just want to highlight some of those things. And I also would ask the question, what are the, 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 the way forward that, uh, or what are the things, the actions taken towards addressing those? Uh, looking at in every school that you go as an economy, you are taught capitalism and it's already in your mind. You are taught how to make profit, how to make business and so on. Um, yeah. Also, you have a lot of policies around us as cooperatives, we are working on policies that are existing within the capitalist system. Um, that is that, that to say it has to do with the government. And also what are, then I come to the question is, what are the real connection that we have with various governments to make sure we actually uh, establish the, the, the core economy? And what education or what are we doing towards the, the, the educational level to be able to, to, to popularize the, 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 the product or the, 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 the new system that we want to move to? Uh, this yeah, is this actually is... my... Yep, and a lot is going on in all business schools. Uh, all of them nowadays subscribe to Prime, which is the Principles for Responsible Management Education. Uh, economics is lagging a bit behind, uh, but uh, management has moved into those spaces. There is uh, courses on social enterprise, social, you know, social economy in some parts of the world and so on. So there's a lot out there in terms of educational opportunities, but you need to know what you're looking for. Uh, and you know, it, it doesn't, you're right, it's not a part of regular education. So our work and our job collectively has to be wherever you are and what is in your surrounding, try and influence those spaces, right? Whichever way you can whether it's through you know, educating more people and making sure that you have a requirement for board directors and management to actually have courses in cooperative business, right? So if that's mandatory, at least they would, they'll start to be educated about it. But also the governments, it seems that, that local municipal level governments are the ones where things are happening. So nowadays with federal and, and national governments, uh, Things in most parts of the world are just out of whack, but where you see change and difference and actually money getting into the, the cooperative economy, uh, it's really more in the municipal and local governments. 
and they, and logically, I think, because they know the people, they know the, you know, the, the, the lay of the land, so to speak. So you can actually elect your local. Uh, and, and then there are associations like cities. There is this association of global cities who want their, their uh, social economy to be dominant in their cities. And Seoul, Korea is one of them. Uh, Montreal in Canada is another. Barcelona in Spain is another, and so on. There's a whole list of them who have municipal governments that are creating social economy. So there is a lot happening on the ground, uh, but this I think is, you know, where are you and what can you do? And then go through federations, your associations, federations, push your cooperative movements in where you are um, to actually see things change. Thank you for your That's question, Zachary. And thank you, Sonia. Yeah. We are at the hour. It's been incredibly stimulating. We have more Nobody questions. Nobody wanted to discuss. Well, <laughs> I'm thinking that perhaps some people would I'll like to stay. It. If, we, uh, <laughs> if we extended for another 10 minutes, some people might want to stay. But just in case people do need to leave, I wonder if, Sonia, you can just go to the next slide just so I can highlight that this, as I mentioned oh, yes. at the beginning, is a part of a series. And so you'll see there that we still have four more free webinars coming up. Uh, in all in November, actually. <laughs> so put them in your calendar, invite folks if you'd like to uh, do so. And managementstudies.coop, you'll see the links to that. And also on the website, you'll see the recording from this uh, webinar later today as well, and from our past webinar series as well. So I invite you all to join us for that and uh, to connect with us on social media too. And all of our contact information is also on the website if anybody wants to do any direct follow-ups who doesn't already know us <laughs> so thank you everyone for being here Sonia and I will stay an extra 10 minutes if we want to uh, move on to other questions uh, next being Hanan thank you hi um, thank you for this this was great I, um, I I mean I'm personally not that it matters for my question ideologically on board with what you are uh, purporting Sonia and really it's asking to be more ambitious and raise the bar with how co-ops assess themselves and, and view their own uh, interaction with the rest of the economy and the rest of the world. Uh, I know, I mean, it gets to the issue of di the diversity of the model being both its advantage and sometimes a disadvantage. And I know that, you know, at the global level, at the ICA and even at, even at, at smaller local levels, there's the notion, well, we need everyone we can get. We need to be able to talk about the, I don't want to point to any names, but we need to also be able to point to the success of the Desjardins of the cooperative movement. So what, how do you, A, reconcile this, and how do you turn that argument around again and say, that's all well and good. We can accept this diversity into the fold as an advantage and also fill in the blank. I mean, what do you, what do you respond when people come with this type of perspective? Uh, I don't know that, um, that I'll answer it, but uh, what I would like to see is the large cooperatives that have grown and the Jordan is a, a good example, but they are still a network of smaller cops, which yeah. to me is a great model. Um, and they do a lot for the, the cooperative uh, economy and cooperative movement. So to me, the question with the large ones is about starting those cooperative funds and starting to use their generational wealth or intergenerational wealth they, that's accumulated to actually create foundations for cooperative development. And that we haven't achieved. So this understanding of, you know, we service our members, we do it now, um, is really with large cops, I think it, it just, they, I don't know that they do enough to actually create the pool of funding and, the, and as I said, corporate mm -hmm. capital that will allow circulation. That to, to me, when you're becoming such, so big and so influential, you also have the political clout, you also have influence in other spaces. So if they're really, uh, you know, full-fledged member of the movement, I think that's where we need to see them very active. And some of them are, as you well know. Um, so, you know, it's, some of them really are. But that, that concerted effort to, to be the guiding light, uh, primarily through capitalization and political clout, to, you know, it seems to me. But as I said, the Jordan is, is not maybe the best example because they are a network. So is Mondragon. They still have yeah. very small, very, very much rooted um, credit unions slash co-ops. 
uh, but the ones that really grew so big and are totally removed now from the movement is where the worry may be, mm-hmm. right? And then the division, of course, you know, the ICMEF, WOKU, the financial uh, and mutual separation from the ICA uh, and in not enough mingling and talking to each other and finding spaces where they can actually help create uh, and boost the cooperative economy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we need them in, in that way, but are they doing it? I don't, I don't know. I mean, we've got yeah. to crunch some numbers <laughs> and see what's happening, yeah. Thanks for your question, Hanan. We have one here from April Harkness uh, saying that she's curious about Economy for the Common Good and she went to their website and noticed that there are no ECG companies in North America. Sonia, do you think it's, do you believe that it's because the matrix parameters are too difficult for most companies to attain? I don't think so because they really start low with low expectations. It's more of a marketing and, and, uh, uh, so B Corps have taken off in, in uh, the States, the United States, uh, because of the specific legal structure in the U.S. That's where the B Corp idea came, uh, you know, came from. And so it's really more of that usefulness and, you know, knowing about, uh, about this and having um, a nice framework that's understood by people, right? This mark. <laughs> uh, I know that uh, Felber has has been talking to the new school um, with the platform co-ops. Oh no, it's with the Humanistic Management, Humanistic Management Association and True Humanistic Management in New York uh, and their network in both, uh, you know, on all continents, quite frankly. He's been trying to promote the model, but it's really more about the promotion. Uh, He also has a publication, uh, the new economy, is it? I, my class will know because it's in your readings <laughs> coming up. So you guys will see the references and the readings. But uh, yeah, so he's, he's trying to push it here, but uh, it's mostly European model at the moment. I don't think it's difficult, is my answer. If you can do B Corps, you can do this. Okay, great. Lots of good comments uh, and we're, we're getting to the bottom yeah. we're doing a bit of investigation on some of the things that came up today so uh, the chat's quite active too um sonia did you want to go back to that last slide about if anybody wants to comment on any of those questions this one yeah if anybody mm-hmm. wanted to add in before we close today and if you want to share who you are what your cooperative is too for our context that's helpful too Well, if they don't, let me just say that I have some extra slides that you are going to get, and they're on this deck, and I'll just put the first one. These are my thoughts of where cooperatives already are present in the circular economy, in the uh, economy for the common good, and how, how these relate, so to solidarity economy, and some of the impact evidence um, from you know, cooperatives uh, influencing the, the economy and uh, transformational kinds of uh, impact. So that's in the slides as well. Uh, but yeah, back to what resonates. Is your co-op doing some of these things? Or connected to the social economy or changing the world? Not sure? Okay. Well, I guess, Erin, we can wrap it up then. And uh, those who are in my class are going to have opportunities to discuss this and take it further. That's right. And uh, I have just sent the, the slides that I sent earlier didn't include those bonus ones, but I've just resent it now. So if you do want that, then go ahead and download that from the chat. And thank you all for being here. Uh, so willingly, <laughs> some as part of your course, hey, uh, but that was great. And uh, if you think that this is useful to other folks in your circles, definitely share with them the link, invite folks to future events too. We want to, obviously our goal is to engage as many folks as possible in these critical conversations about where our economy is going and what the role of cooperatives can be. So thank you, Sonia. Uh, thank oh, you, everyone. Hi. And uh, yes, it'll be recorded and, or it was recorded and it will go up on the website later today, managementservice.coop. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. See you soon, I hope.